We've heard the narrative many times before. The music industry copy-pastes some black girl swag onto a white girl, and the white girl gets rich and famous off it. Fergie? Check. Gwen Stefani? Check. Miley Cyrus? Check. Ariana Grande? Check. Whatever's going on here? Check. This is a pretty cold take, and regardless of what you think about it, you're probably tired of this narrative because it's all you've been hearing about for the past decade. But what if I told you that this phenomenon in pop music is not confined to the 21st century, and that one of its strangest examples was from almost 100 years ago? In fact, the white girl in question got the tables turned on her when she got her stolen style jacked by a cartoon character who is far better remembered today than she is. But has the narrative that surrounds this story been condensed to the point of being inaccurate? Time is a flat circle after all, so if you want to hear the recording industry's explosive and complex early case of swagger jacking, come Charleston your way back to 1928 and I'll tell you the story. Born to immigrant parents in 1904 in the Bronx, Helen Kane dreamed of being a performer since childhood. By age 15, she was touring the nation with the Marx Brothers and by the early 1920s was singing in vaudeville, a style of touring variety show that was massively popular in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. She worked consistently between vaudeville and Broadway, but was still a relative unknown until 1928, when during a performance of the song That's My Weakness Now at the Paramount Theater in New York City, she ad-libbed the four words that would make her famous. Well, not words really, but the four syllables that would make her famous. During this time, she recorded Get Out and Get Under the Moon and That's My Weakness Now, which were pressed on two sides of the same record. Both sides were a success nationally on radio and in stores, proving Helen Kane a rising pop star in 1928. Not long after, one of her performances was attended by songwriting partners Burt Coleman and Harry Ruby. They had just finished writing the score for a musical titled Good Boy and pegged Kane as perfect for the female lead. She won the role and the show was a runaway success. She inflected her famous boop boop a doop into the show's number I Wanna Be Loved By You, which she soon recorded. So if you've never heard I Wanna Be Loved By You before, it may actually jar you at just how dated it sounds. Some hit records are timeless, but this one is very much of its time. I wanna be loved by you, just you. One of these dated trends is the baby voice that Helen Kane recorded all her songs in. This was not an invention of Kane's and was a very popular style for female singers to employ in the early 1900s. One of the earliest of such examples is Irene Franklin's I've Got the Mumps from 1909. Because he broke his leg, but I'm got the mom. How seriously audiences took this style is unclear. On one hand, this and many other songs were sung in this style, so there was probably little novelty appeal here. But on the other hand, the label itself credits the song to Helen Kane, comedienne with orchestra. The other trend, of course, is scat singing. Also simply called scatting, the technique uses the singer's voice as an instrument, improvising random syllables and nonsense words into different melodies and rhythms. Kane used the technique mostly as an accent to the written lyrics of the song, peppering them in instead of dedicating an entire verse to them. It seems clear that the scatting had come to be recognized as the highlight of the performance by the time of its commercial recording, as the backing music drops out completely every time Helen Kane scats. On the heels of two other hits, I Want to Be Loved by You was primed for commercial success. There weren't any national billboard charts in the 1920s, but records indicate that I Want to Be Loved by You was a massive hit in the United States. Chart historian Joel Whitburn retroactively ranked the song as a number two hit in his book Pop Memories, though the historical accuracy of this book has been disputed. That said, we'll have to take anecdotal history over no history at all. Kane became known as the Boop Boop a Doop Girl and became a famous star, an idealized image of the roaring 1920s flapper and a sex symbol to boop. I mean, to boot. She signed to Paramount Pictures in mid-1929, 
appearing mostly in supporting roles in musicals and extravaganza-style films, the latter of which were more focused on packing in celebrity cameos than telling a compelling story. Her biggest role was in The Dangerous Nan McGrew, in which she played the leader of an outlaw band of entertainers. Dangerous Nan McGrew. After a few years, however, Kane's popularity was wavering. By 1931, the Great Depression was in full swing and her flapper image had become instantly dated. She was finished making movies and faded into relative obscurity. If Kane were the only boop boop a doop girl in town, that would have been the end of the story. If you recognize the phrase already, however, you probably know it from a girl who's almost identical to Kane, but exists only in two dimensions instead of three. Boop, boop, doop. Betty Boop first appeared in a bit part in the Fleischer Studios cartoon Dizzy Dishes in 1930. She was more of a sexy dog than a human, but regardless of her species, she was clearly a caricature of Helen Kane, right down to her boop boop a doop vocalizations. Within a year, Betty Boop had shed her droopy ears for hoop earrings and became a fully human character, and the star of her own cartoons, surpassing the fading Kane in popularity. Kane was quick to take notice, filing a $250,000 infringement lawsuit against Betty Boop's creator, Fleischer Studios, and their distributor, Paramount Pictures, also Kane's former employer. She claimed that Betty Boop was a deliberate caricature that produced unfair competition. Fleischer Studios had Max Fleischer claimed that her image was based on no person in particular, noting that Boop resembled both Kane and Paramount star Clara Bow. As for her sound, well, nobody could contest that Kane owned Boop Boop a Doop, right? Apparently they could, as Paramount produced a theater manager who claimed that Boop Boop a Doop had, in fact, come from a black child performer named Little Esther, and that both Kane and her manager had come to see Little Esther live shortly before Kane appeared at the Paramount Theater and incorporated scatting into her act. Esther Jones, who performed under the name Little Esther and occasionally Baby Esther, would have been only around nine years old when Kane saw her in the theater. She appears to have been a somewhat notable entertainer in her home country of the United States, singing, dancing, and doing acrobatics in nightclubs in New York City and Chicago. But it appears that she enjoyed her career's biggest success on an early 1930s tour of Europe and South America, during which she performed for huge crowds and even held special audiences with various European royal families. Esther was presumably still abroad during the trial, but Paramount dredged up an early sound test film of little Esther performing, including Boop Boop a Doop scatting, as evidence. Although this footage is now lost, this was enough for Judge Edward McGoldrick, who dismissed Kane's lawsuit on the grounds that neither her image nor sound were unique. For Helen Kane and I Want to Be Loved by You, the following two decades were pretty lean, though they did see some renewed interest in the 1950s. The 1950 film Three Little Words, which told the story of songwriting partners Burt Calmer and Harry Ruby, featured a then-unknown Debbie Reynolds as Helen Kane. I want to be loved by you. Eight years later, Kane was honored on an episode of This Is Your Life, in which she was presented with a retrospective of her career and surprised by old friends and collaborators. The following year, Marilyn Monroe sang I Want to Be Loved by You in the comedy film Some Like It Hot, a film set in the 1920s that introduced the song to the baby boomer generation. The deedly 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 dum, boop boop be doop. Kane went on to make a few appearances on TV game shows and late night programs before her death in 1966 after a long battle with breast cancer. Though her mainstream popularity lasted only a few years, she was remembered as an idol of the Roaring Twenties. In 2002, the Recording Industry Association of America released its top songs of the first century of recorded music based on the selections of hundreds of music lovers. By then, the song had fully cemented itself as a symbol of the Roaring Twenties, as I Want to Be Loved by You was ranked at number 128. Betty Boop, however, long outlasted Kane in popularity. After becoming a major sex symbol of the 1930s, she continued to appear in animation for decades to come. While no vehicles have been produced for her recently, she continues to be a mainstay on trashy t-shirts all around the world. It's important to note, however, that Fleischer Studios animator Grim Natwick stated later that he was originally instructed to design a character as a caricature of Helen Kane, even being provided a photograph to work off of. This character, of course, became Betty Boop, who was voiced by Helen Kane's soundalike located by the studio. That evidence, 
combined with the fact that Betty Boop also assumed the name Dangerous Nan McGrew in the 1931 short The Bum Bandit, pretty clearly exemplifies that Betty Boop was based on Helen Kane. And what about Little Esther? Apparently homesick, Little Esther stopped touring abroad by the mid-1930s at the ripe old age of 15 and seemingly disappeared, as virtually nothing is known about her life after her return to the United States. Here, three major problems present themselves. The unending march of time, the lack of information about Little Esther, and the internet's well-meaning love of spreading information that has not been fact-checked. Aided by the two former and fueled by the latter, a number of memes have made the rounds on the web for the past few years, giving an always oversimplified and often inaccurate version of this story. Many of these claim that Betty Boop was directly based off Little Esther, which simply isn't true. Many of these show photographs of people other than Little Esther, which is misleading, and some even claim that Little Esther spent the rest of her life trying to win back the rights to her image, which is highly unlikely as there's no record that Little Esther was aware of Helen Kane ripping her off, let alone Betty Boop ripping her off by extension. It's important to point out that Little Esther herself was often compared to an earlier performer, Florence Mills, even outright being called an imitator in 1928. It's also been proposed that another performer, Gertrude Saunders, was scatting boop boop a doop on stage in the mid-1920s. And it's worth noting that while Louis Armstrong may have brought scat singing into the popular consciousness of the 1920s, there are recorded examples of performer scat singing as early as 1911. So while Helen Kane did take boop boop a doop from Little Esther, it's unclear if that was even something that belonged to Esther to begin with. But trying to reason with internet outrage is rarely a fruitful endeavor. Believe what you will, I've done the research to the best of my abilities. There's a lot to unpack here. Regardless of her actions, I kind of sympathize with Helen Kane. Like, if Ariana Grande went broke and stopped being popular tomorrow, but then a sexy drawing of her became one of the most well-known and profitable characters of the next hundred years, wouldn't you feel like she's entitled to something? I hate this like man every day. day. <laughs> When it comes to Little Esther, it appears that she actually had a more successful career than Helen Kane did, just not in the United States. I don't think that the tragic narrative that surrounds her on the internet is really deserved because we don't have enough evidence to know that her life was really that tragic. Esther didn't invent scatting nor singing in a baby voice, and while she certainly was an influence on Betty Boop, the internet's desire to paint her as the black Betty Boop seems particularly ill-advised. I honestly think it's a disservice to her legacy to get her so wrapped up in this story. There's nothing wrong with wanting a black Betty Boop, but justifying it by conflating the legacy of a black child performer with a white sex symbol just seems misguided to me. Ultimately, the history will never be complete. We'll never know the full story because everyone involved died a long ass time ago. As an amateur internet sleuth, this will keep me up at night, but c'est la vie. And uh, the song that got us here in the first place, I Want to Be Loved by You, it's pretty goofy, but I listen to it from time to time to remind myself at just how fleeting trends can be. The fact that a song full of made-up words in a baby voice was a huge hit enjoyed by millions of Americans really puts life in perspective. Nothing lasts forever, no matter how popular it is.